Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And I'll bet you're all anxious to resume our reading and discussion of this uh, most revealing book, The Global Vatican, by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. Mr. Rooney was uh, telling us yesterday in his book about the relationship, the unholy relationship between Antichrist Pope Benedict the Fifteenth and U.S. President Woodrow Wilson during the times of the First and Second World World Wars. Let me let me set the stage for you. We have the Jesuits, who are the fomenters of war, have aligned all of Europe for a conflagration. And they're going to involve the United States through President Wilson. It's going to be a European, or rather a global, persecution of the enemies of the Roman Catholic Church. The Orthodox Christians, they call themselves Christians, the Orthodox, just the eastern wing of the Roman Catholic Church, that uh, separated from Rome because of an argument over the primacy of the Pope. (laughs) And then we have the uh, persecuted Jews... Uh, Rome has to have a reason to create a modern nation state of Israel for the to really set the stage for Satan's last hurrah to claim himself to be king of kings and lord of lords from Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. So we have the persecution of the Jews. And what is never talked about, hardly ever talked about, is the, the persecution of the Protestants in Europe. And most importantly, from the very seat of the Protestant Reformation, Germany. Germany is going to suffer like no nation on earth for the Protestant Reformation. We have the Jesuits have aligned all these things and have fomented the the First and Second World Wars. We have the current Pope, Pope Benedict the, the 15th at the time, standing aloof and claiming to be the harbinger of peace, telling all of Europe to lay down their arms and return to the status quo antebellum, that is, before the conflict. And we have President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, appearing to kind of waffle, wanting to be a peacemaker, but waffling and then eventually involving the United States in the war and following the Jesuit script to perfection. Now, we're supposed to believe that President Wilson had the United States' best interest at heart. We're led to believe that Woodrow Wilson was Protestant in his beliefs, but he followed the Jesuit script. He involved the United States in that papal proxy war against the heretics, American Protestants fighting and dying in Europe, bombing Protestant cities in Germany, and uh, we're supposed to believe Wilson wasn't tainted by Jesuit influence. I mean, even in order to justify the United States' involvement in that war, there was a letter discovered from the Nazi Germany in attempting to align itself with Mexico over a common invasion of the United States. That was the justification. Now remember, the Nazis were controlled by the Jesuits. The SS was a Jesuit institution. They wore Jesuit insignia. They operated their organization like the Jesuits. We have Adolf Hitler, born and raised Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic all his life, And, of course, Mexico is a Roman Catholic country. 98% of the population in Mexico are Roman Catholic, and the government is Roman Catholic. And that's all it took to get the United States involved in the war. The stage is set. There's going to be war. And the United States is going to help elevate the Pope's victory in Europe. They call it a Protestant country. I want you to know what really happened. Facts that your history books didn't tell you. Because it in, it reveals 
a hidden hand in the United States of America, the government of the United States of America. Now we're going to continue the last full paragraph on page 75, <clears throat> if you're following along in your copy of the book. It says that Benedict's Vatican and Wilson's America found themselves in alignment should have been no surprise, given the fundamental ideals shared by the Catholic Church and the United States, as explored earlier in earlier chapters of this book. In the past, <clears throat> in the past, let me say in the Protestant past of America, much had become, uh, much had come between them in the way of prejudice and suspicion which prevented each from recognizing its natural affinity with the other. At last, here was an opportunity for them to join forces to pursue a shared, symmetrical goal of ending the war and constructing a post-war peace which could endure, based upon universal, notice the, the use of the word universal, based upon universal, read that, Catholic, moral principles and laws. Very shrewd choice of words this author uses. We know that the word universal is interchangeable with the word Catholic. That's taught in all the Roman Catholic parochial schools. Universal and Catholic are the same. Okay, so the, a post-war peace which could endure based upon Catholic moral principles and laws. It is one of history's great misfortunes that the opportunity was not taken. Misfortunes? Says the author. What misfortune? We know the, <coughs> the, the, the Roman Catholic Church has told us the Church is more dynamic in times of war than it is in times of peace. We know that the Jesuits fomented this war to help elevate the papacy to global supremacy to persecute the heretics, to set the stage for the, the final act of Satan in, in, in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, and to make America Catholic, and to use the United States to force the whole world to worship the papacy. And you call this war, this failure to bring peace by Pope Benedict XV and Woodrow Wilson, an, unfort an, an unfortunate uh, mistake. <laughs> the whole world buys your lies, but we know the truth. Okay? The church attempted on several occasions to reach out and work with the United States, but these efforts were ignored by Wilson, says the author. Remember, he's following the Jesuit script, appearing to be in disagreement with the Vatican, but he's following the Jesuit script. All right? The president and his advisors never warmed to collaboration with the Pope. In part, their attitude reflected the administration's position, shared and supply, uh, shared and shaped by the Allies, that the Roman Catholic Church's historic relationship with Catholic Austria-Hungary meant that the Pope favored the Central Powers. Perhaps a less than noble desire among some of Wilson's advisors was to place their president in a position to claim sole credit for brokering peace. As one historian wrote of the president's attitude toward the Vatican's efforts, quote, he reserved for himself the exclusive right to make the proposals for peace, unquote. So they're making it even look like a, a little controversy between Wilson and the Pope. Who could be the best peacemaker while they're all following the war script? The whole world buys your lies. And it says, no doubt, reflexive American anti-Catholicism also played into the Wilson administration's reluctance to work with the Vatican, a number of, pro of prominent Protestant Americans urged Wilson to avoid dealing with the Pope at any level. I can just hear their voices. He's the Antichrist, Wilson. He's the Antichrist, President Wilson. You cannot, as the, the chief executive officer of a Protestant land, getting in league 
with the Antichrist of the Bible. You'll bring about a civil religious war in this country. We're not going to let the Catholic Pope rule this world. We're not going to let him rule America. We're not going to let him control the President of the United States, President Wilson. Can you just hear him? Here you are in bed with the scarlet harlot of Rome, and you expect us Protestants to be quiet about it? You being sucked into this Jesuit war, who's going to die? Protestant soldiers, that's who's going to die. You're going to fight this war in, in Germany, the seat of the Protestant Reformation. You're going to persecute the Protestants of Germany. You're going to kill the Jews of Germany. You're going to po prose help prosecute and persecute the Orthodox who seceded from Rome in 1058, 54 AD, 1054 AD. What is the matter with you, Wilson? Don't you have any Protestant education? What business do you have outside of the will of the American people, the Protestant people of this country, making leagues with the Antichrist of the Bible. Who elected you president to get this country involved in a crusade? Can you just hear the Protestant voices? But they're silent in this book. The author doesn't name you the reasons why the Protestants chided Wilson for getting involved he left out the details strategically left out the details of that decision and how it was made by the Protestants who went to Wilson admonishing him you get in bed with Rome and you're going to come down with a spiritual venereal disease and you're going to lose your blood and your treasure and your sovereignty. That's what's going to happen. Because the Pope will rule come hooker by crook. Okay? The Protestants of this country already knew enough history about the Roman Catholic Church to never permit the President of the United States to make any league with the Vatican. There was still a shred of Protestantism left in this world. And if you don't think Woodrow Wilson was following the Jesuit script for the Second World War, then explain to me how it was the Wilson administration that got us the Federal Reserve Bank, which is nothing but a Jesuit bank, to which we are incalculably indebted because of the wars that we've fought on behalf of the papacy. We will never be able to pay that debt. The papacy knows it. Our government knows it. And the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 actually took away from Congress the right to regulate our economy and print our money. The Federal Reserve Bank is a Jesuit bank. And when you pay your taxes every April 15th, 60% of the money that you pay goes directly to the Jesuit order. Because they run the bank. Was Wilson really an American? Protestant president or was he a papal stooge? I say the latter. And so has every president since his time. He says the church attempted on several occasions to reach out and work with the United States, but these efforts were ignored by Wilson, says the author. The president and his advisors never warmed to collaboration with the Pope. In part, their attitude reflected the administration's position, shared and shaped by the Allies, that the Church's historic relationship with Catholic Austria-Hungary meant that the Pope favored the Central Powers. Perhaps a less than noble desire among some of Wilson's advisors was to place their president in a position to claim sole credit for brokering the peace, as one historian wrote that the president's attitude toward the Vatican efforts, he, quote, reserved for himself the exclusive right to make the proposals for peace. No doubt reflexive American anti-Catholicism also played into the Wilson administration's reluctance to work with the Vatican. 
a number of Protest, a prominent Protestant Americans urged Wilson to avoid dealing with the Pope at any level, and any suggestion of the Holy See U.S. cooperation brought instant outrage from certain quarters. What certain quarters? Protestant quarters. You see, there were some still in the United States who knew who the Antichrist was. There were some still in the United States that had not bought the futurist lie that the Antichrist is a future individual that has not yet arrived on the world scene and won't arise on the world scene until just seven years before Christ's return. They didn't buy the Jesuit lie, and they still viewed the papacy as the Antichrist of the Bible. That's the certain quarters spoken of here. A number of prominent Protestant Americans urged Wilson to avoid dealing with the Pope at any level, and any suggestion of Holy See U.S. cooperation brought instant outrage from certain quarters. Where are the, where's the outrage today? Where's the outrage today when we see President George W. Bush making alliances with the papacy? And waging a holy Roman crusade against the Muslims in in, in uh, uh, Iraq and eventually Iran. This global war that they fomented during the George W. Bush administration is never going to end. Not until Christ returns. It's burning the heretics. That's what it is. It's a papal crusade. That's all it is. They must secure Jerusalem for a papal dictatorship and the recalcitrant Muslims surrounding Israel must be dealt with and they've labeled them radical fundamentalists well guess who else is answerable to that term radical fundamentalists Protestants they've already incited the hatred for Protestants by inciting hatred against radical fundamentalist Muslims. <clears throat> the Inquisition's coming to Protestant America. The last Protestant voices left in this country are going to be the targets. We're going to be lumped right in with those radical fundamentalists that we've been warring against ever since 9-11. Uh, They've already set the stage for our annihilation. That's why this program's called Inquisition Update. But during the Wilson administration, while President Wilson was following the Jesuit script loyally, despite all outward appearances, he was following the Jesuit script, there were prominent Protestant Americans urging Wilson to avoid dealing with the Pope, that is, with the Antichrist at any level, and suggesting any Holy See U.S. cooperation would be immediately met with outrage from the Protestants. You see anything like that in this country today? I'll tell you what I see in my discussions on amateur radio. Anybody that speaks against this war are jammed right off the band. And the government knows it. The Federal Communications Commission knows about it. And so does the American Radio Relay League that is supposed to be, well, the organization for amateur radio operators. They work together to see to it that certain discussions on amateur radio are, are not allowed to continue. Violating my First Amendment rights. They jam me to oblivion. Nobody can hear my signals for all the jamming. And the federal government and the Amateur Radio Relay League do nothing to stop the jamming. The Protestant voice is going to be stopped in this country. I've already experienced the tactics that they will use to stop the Protestant voice in this country. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen the government cooperate with it. I've seen the American Radio Amateur Radio Relay League cooperate with it. 
They're going to silence us everywhere we raise our voices. Never let it be known that the papacy is the Antichrist. Because the papacy is going to rule the world. He already does. He was ruling the Wilson administration. He says Wilson's personal feelings toward the Catholic Church are hard to decipher. He had many Catholic friends and political associates, but he had been schooled in the popular anti-Catholic prejudices of the 19th century America and seemed to share some of them. When Wilson was an undergraduate, one of his professors of civil government at Princeton had railed against papal influence as a danger, quote, not only in European, but also in American politics, unquote. Wish I'd sat in his civil government classroom, don't you? As a law student at University of Virginia, Wilson had engaged in a formal debate with other students on the question, quote, is the Roman Catholic element, that is the Roman Catholic Church in the United States, a menace to American institutions, unquote? It's virtually the same question that John Adams posed to Thomas Jefferson in 1821. By lots, Wilson drew the negative in the debate and argued that the United States could easily assimilate Catholics without harm to its institutions. That he lost the debate is unimportant, says this author. That the quote-unquote menace of Catholicism was still a matter of debate is telling. Yeah, it's telling. It's telling, all right there was still a shred of Protestantism left in this country that knew that the papacy and Romanism was the greatest of all fears, the greatest to be feared in any country. Can you believe Wilson had some Protestant understanding and couldn't understand that he was following the Jesuit script in World War I? He says, years later, Wilson unflatteringly portrayed Catholic immigrants as, quote, multitudes of men of the lowest class from the south of Italy <clears throat> and the men of the nearer, uh, meaner sort out of Hungary and Poland, unquote, in his 1901 book entitled History of the American People. So Wilson had anti-Catholic leanings, or so it appears. He did, after all, perfectly follow the Jesuit script. He says, by the time he was president, his views seemed to have become a bit more politic, but he remained snobbishly dismissive of Catholics. <clears throat> was that all for public appearance? He had to have some way to deny any charges that he was following the Jesuit script and getting the United States involved in a papal proxy war in Europe. So they just accused him of being anti-Catholic. Well, that satisfies me, say most Americans. Most Americans don't care whether he was Catholic or Protestant or anything else. He was president of the United States, and he should be honored and obeyed like a king. Check your brain and your Bibles at the door. Just obey whatever your pastor and whatever your president tell you. And if Rome controls them and leads you into a holocaust, well, you were just doing what you were told. That's the mentality of America. There's no Protestantism left. It's toast. The United States is toast without Protestant beliefs, without biblical, historical, and prophetic understanding, America's going the way of Baal. And there's no stopping it. Unless we raise another Protestant Reformation in this country. We'll be back right after these messages. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support Inquisition Update and continue to hear this broadcast on First Amendment Radio, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. And if you'd like to make comment or questions to me directly, you may do so by email. My email address is tom at cwaves.us. Tom at S-E-A-W-A-V-E-S dot U-S. And I've received some very encouraging emails recently. Many of you are listening and taking the time to say, I get it. I'm getting it. And you're also praying for me. That means more to me than anything. Pray for me. Now, <clears throat> back to the book. It appears, for all outward appearances, that President Wilson is not cooperating with the Vatican. They've made it to seem, apparently, that there's a disconnect between Wilson and the, and the, and the Pope. It says, whatever the reason for the White House's reluctance to work with the Vatican, talk of peace was effectively tabled in February of 1917. Why? Because the Jesuits don't want peace. They've got to prosecute this war. And they've got to have this war. They've got to have the United States involved in it. And they've got to make it look like the United States isn't cooperating with the papacy. The papacy, all the while, through the Jesuits, fomenting this war, and then pretending publicly to be the great peacemaker and arbiter to settle the war before the bloodshed starts. Wilson trying to copycat that role, but at the same time eager beaver just to get involved in the war. If this is just too easy. This isn't difficult to understand what's going on here. The papacy and the and the combatant powers at the time of, in Europe and the United States were all cooperating with this and leaving the public perception 
that they weren't themselves fomenting the wars. He says, whatever the reason for the White House's reluctance to work with the Vatican, talk of peace was effectively tabled in February of 1970. Of course it had to be tabled. He said, that is when Germany resumed unrestricted submarine warfare. The United States judged this a direct threat to its own shipping and broke off diplomatic relations with Germany. Step number one. We're headed for crusade. Okay? When the infamous Zimmerman telegram in which Germany invited Mexico, that is, let me finish it to the sentence for you, Roman Catholic Germany invited Roman Catholic Mexico to join in future battle against the United States became public in March 1st. American neutrality ended. It's all, that's all it took to get the United States into war. An intercepted telegram between Germany and Mexico inciting a joint effort to destroy the United States. That's all it took. It was published in the papers. Now we're off to the war. No Protestant wisdom involved. We're off to the Crusades. The Jesuits are going to have their way. There's going to be a global bloodbath. And outside of that, we're going to get a new global government called the United... The, the, well, eventually the United Nations, called the League of Nations at this time. Protestants are going to die. Jews are going to die. Orthodox are going to die. They're going to create a need through the, the slaughter of the Holocaust, a need for a, a nation state for the world's Jews, and then the Pope will be set to go for the final deception. America will be made Catholic, and the whole world bends the knee to bail. Okay? Thank God I'm not the only one that gets this. Some of my listeners have, have, have replied and said, I'm getting it. He said, when the infamous Zimmerman telegram, in which Roman Catholic, I will add, Roman Catholic Germany invited Roman Catholic Mexico to join in future battle against the United States, became public on March 1st, American neutrality ended. The United States declared war against Germany on April 6th, 1917. They didn't waste any time. The next month, they declared war on Germany. The Holocaust is now going to be fueled with American technology, American might, American Protestant blood. We're going to have Protestants killing Protestants in Germany. And the Pope sitting on his white marble throne in the Vatican just laughing his diabolical fanny off. The Inquisition's going to go off without a hitch with the cooperation of the American government. Even in spite of Protestant protest, they're going to war. They're going to fight a crusade for the Pope. Benedict, now alone as a peacemaker, can you just listen to this? Listen to this. Benedict, now alone as a peace broker, was more determined than ever to bring the war to a close. In mid-August 1917, he released, quote, the peace note, unquote, his most detailed and ambitious proposal yet. Copies were prepared for the heads of the belligerent states, placed in large engraved envelopes, then distributed because the United States did not have official, official diplomatic relations with the Holy See, President Wilson's envelope was delivered to him via the British government. The note was a remarkable document, says the author, both as a general indictment of the war and as a brass tax plan for resolving the conflict. After assuming the belligerents or rather, after assuring the belligerents he strived to maintain perfect impartiality, quote-unquote, Benedict reminded them that he had already made previous efforts at peace. Quote, Unfortunately, our appeal was not heeded, 
and the war was fiercely carried on for two years more with all its horrors. It became even more cruel and spread over land and sea and even to the air. And desolation and death were seen to fall upon defenseless cities, peaceful villages, and in innocent populations. And now no one can imagine how much the general suffering will increase and become worse. Is this civilized world to be turned into a field of death? And is Europe so glorious and flourishing to rush as carried by a universal folly. <laughs> Remember what I said about the word universal? As carried by a Roman Catholic folly to the abyss and take a hand in its own suicide? Unquote. And the world bought it. The world bought it. <sighs> I'll tell you what, my sigh isn't for dramatic pause. It takes a great deal of fortitude to read this crap. Because that's what it is. Crap! Straight from the pits of hell! I have uncovered and discovered the Antichrist of the Bible. And I can hardly get anyone to listen to me. And to read how they've duped this American, this American government into carrying the battle axe for the Antichrist of the Bible is almost more than I can bear. And there's no protest. He says, ensuring, uh, ensuing from this aggressive introduction, the peace note stipulated seven conditions for peace, including simultaneous and reciprocal disarmament and a quote-unquote institution of arbitration, unquote, there's your League of Nations, that would settle international conflicts. This is a global government. The Pope is proposing a global government. Well, obviously, if, he, if the Pope is proposing it, he's going to control it. The Antichrist of the Bible is going to control it. He wants an institution of arbitration. He doesn't want the Pope to anymore carry the baggage, the papacy to carry the baggage. He wants He wants his own elected or his own appointed uh, institution to carry the baggage. See, more and more they have to make the Pope the, 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 the neutral peacemaker out of the deal. But the Pope's going to rule with a rod of iron if he has to create his own institution to do it. To take the heat off of him, see? That's what the League of Nations was all about. That's what the United Nations is all about. It's the carrot and the sword. The carrot and the stick. The Pope w goes around waving the carrot, but his institution, his institution of arbitration, the United Nations, carries the stick. The Pope's writing the script for all this. He said, ensuing from this aggressive introduction, the peace note stipulated seven conditions for peace including simultaneous and reciprocal disarmament and institution of arbitration that world settlement uh, that 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 or rather an institution of arbitration that would settle international conflicts restoration of all occupied territories to their pre-war status and a renunciation of indemnities in other words all belligerents would stand down, give back what they had taken, and forego, that is, leave aside, abandon, imposing any punitive measures against their opponents. Why, if that isn't a message of peace, I don't know where you could find a better one. The Pope, the peacemaker, man. You buy it? The whole world bought it. You just as well buy it. The warmonger, the destroyer of the Bible. 
is regarded in the world as a peacemaker. You can't make up stuff like this. Truly he has deceived the whole world just like the Bible says. Even the very elect. He says while none of these conditions was new, they were articulated more clearly than in previous papal writings. Quote, he goes into details, praised the nation, a liberal American magazine not known for praising popes. Quote, he states terms, unquote. Yeah, the papacy is even stating the terms for the peace of a war that he is incited, he is fueling, and he is benefiting from. Benedict's note was greeted with great public attention when it appeared, with the cooperation of the press, you can better believe it. It says, newspapers around the world ran it in full as the warring nations paused to frame their responses. But the response everybody wanted to hear was that of the United States. As the French ambassador to Washington, John Jules Jusserin, wrote to Secretary of State Robert Lansing on August 18, the Allies desired to know the President's opinion, quote, so that a similar attitude be observed by those who fight on the same side of the trench, unquote. In Jusserin's view, the note was written under, quote-unquote, inimical influences, presumably meaning pressure from the Austrians and Germans. This opinion was shared by the other allies who had perhaps greater reason than ever to deny Benedict's terms. See, they're denying Benedict's terms of peace. They have so entrenched these people in war that for all intents and purposes, their very survival depended upon their prosecution of the war. The Pope knew there was going to be no peace. He could state any peace terms he wants with as much detail as he wants. They were so dedicated to war, he had no hope of promoting peace. So that's why he took the role of the peacemaker. And the whole world bought it. He says, with millions of their young now dead and tens of thousands more casualties every week, how could they accept the Pope's call for a non-punitive peace? Such an end would imply that the war had been for nothing. The quote-unquote peace note was a dead letter before it was ever delivered. <laughs> That's why the Pope delivered it. He knew it was dead before it ever left his hand. There was going to be war. The crusade was going on. And he could say and do anything he wanted. He could stand up on his, you know, great white throne and proclaim peace over the world. And he knew there wasn't going to be any peace. That Protestants and Jews and Orthodox were going to die by the millions. Glory be to the Pope. And America was just as, uh, just as hungry for Protestant blood in Germany as was the Pope. So who was running the White House? The same ones that run the White House today. The Jesuits of Georgetown and Fordham Universities. And all the 28 Jesuit universities in this country. They're making America Catholic without your knowledge, without your approval, and without even telling you how they're doing it. But it, they're doing it in plain sight. All you have to do is have a little Protestant understanding, a little hi a historical understanding, a little prophetic understanding, and you can almost predict what they're going to do. <clears throat> he says the one man who could have revived it, that is the peace effort, was Woodrow Wilson. If he got behind the peace note, it stood a chance of gaining ground. If not, it had no chance at all. <laughs> Wilson consulted his, invi his advisors and met with a group of senators at the White House on August 17th to discuss the Pope's note. 
He appeared to be under a good deal of strain as he framed his response, though it's not clear that he ever gave serious consideration to answering other than as he did. Summoning the U.S. forces to war. He was Jesuit controlled from stem to stern. And they wrote him down in history as a peacemaker, just like the Pope. Kind of like the image of the beast. The beast and the image of the beast. You can hardly tell them apart. The Vatican, the Holy See, and the U.S. government. Clones of one another. You can't hardly tell the difference. It says on August 28th, he finally sent a letter to Pope Benedict XV. Do tell. It was a courteous but devastating rejection. Benedict later told friends that receiving Wilson's response brought one of the bitterest moments of his life. Gag me with a spoon, right? President Wilson has rejected my peace overtures. He could have helped the peace effort, but no, he chose to go to war just like the Jesuits instructed him to do. And now I, I alone am the peacemaker in the world. By peace he shall destroy many. Does anybody recognize that, where it comes from? What's the Bible? By peace he shall destroy many. This is prophecy being fulfilled. You see, you can't see Bible prophecy being fulfilled unless you see it in history. You have to be a student of history to see Bible prophecy being fulfilled in the world. And this is where that prophecy is fulfilled. By peace he shall destroy many. The great peace, the great peace arbiter in the world is the Pope, don't you know? And he's destroying the world for his own benefit. Not for the benefit of Christ. Not to elevate Christ to King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but to elevate himself to King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And your Protestant America is helping him with both hands and both feet, with all their blood and all their guts and all their treasure. And you think, because I raised my voice, I sound like a raving lunatic? As though I don't have cause? Quote, every heart that has not been blinded and hardened by this terrible war must be touched by this moving appeal of His Holiness the Pope. Must feel the dignity and force of the humane and generous motives which prompted it, wrote Wilson, and must fervently wish that we might take the path of peace, he so persuasively points out. But it would be folly to take it if it does not, in fact, lead the goal he proposes, unquote. Glorious praise from Protestant President Woodrow Wilson for the sole arbiter of peace in the world, His Holiness the Pope. Unbelievable. Abandoning his own earlier concurrence with the Pope that there should be, quote, peace without victory, unquote. Wilson now insisted that the, quote, stable and enduring peace, unquote, desired by the Pope could not be achieved without total defeat of Protestant Germany, a country from which America suffered, quote, unquote, intolerable wrongs, unquote. Wilson's tone managed to be both fulsome and patronizing at the same time. We're going to war. We're going to war at the heart of the Protestant Reformation, Germany. We're going to help them kill the Protestants, the Jews, the Orthodox in Germany. We are going to go on this crusade, but we love peace. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, 
the Pope is the great peacemaker. We could have just got it together and followed the Pope's instructions. But no, now the United States is being threatened by Germany and Catholic Germany and Catholic Mexico. We've got to go to war. We just simply must go to war. Are you getting it? Somebody else write me and tell me. I'm getting it. I'm, I'm getting it. President Wilson's response, soon made public, was praised in the press as a fine work of diplomacy. By turning down the Pope, you know that had to look really good to the Protestants. By turning down the Pope, he was seen to have claimed the moral leadership for himself and the United States. When peace came, it would be the President, not the Pope, who set the terms. You know who set the terms after that war? The Jesuits at Versailles. And it was so punitive against Germany that it necessitated the continuance of that war called the Second World War. It was going to take two global crusades for the Pope to get what he wanted for the Jesuits to get what they wanted. A Roman Catholic America, a Roman Catholic Europe, a modern nation state for Israel so that they can foment their phony futurist interpretation of Daniel 9.27. And then the final chance to elevate the Pope. Once the so-called Antichrist is destroyed, the one that signs the seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, once he's destroyed, the papacy is has a clear playing field to be anything he wants to be in the world. By that time, the world will be so destitute of war, so sick and tired of war, that they will accept Mickey Mouse as their Messiah. And that's who they're going to get, the Mickey Mouse from Rome. President Wilson's response, soon made public, was praised in the press as a fine work of diplomacy. But turning down the Pope, by turning down the Pope, he was seen to have claimed the moral leadership for himself and the United States. When peace came, it would be the President, not the Pope, who set the terms. In the short run, this was good for Wilson's image. In the long run, it was unfortunate for the world, says this Roman Catholic author and U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. Just as, mar just as much a part of this deception as anyone else. Thanks for listening. We'll be back tomorrow to continue where we left off today. Please pray and write to me. Tell me, are you getting it? Are you getting it? We'll be back tomorrow. Inquisition update on First Amendment Radio.